All right, so welcome to Judaism, Jewish Community, and Race, a course from Pluralistic Rabbinical Seminary. This masterclass is made possible by our friendship with Tribe Herald Media. So we thank you, Tribe Herald, for helping us put this together. Our guest is Yitz Jordan, co-founder and chief executive officer at Tribe Herald. Uh, you may know Yitz from his moniker, Why Love. Uh, for transparency's sake, I should say I've known Yitz for almost a decade, and his Jewish activist work is part of why the Punk Torah network of websites managed to flourish as it did in the early days. So Yitz, welcome to Pluralistic Rabbinical Seminary. Well, we're certainly glad to have you. Um, I'd like to begin by reading a quote from your piece on Tribe Herald, We Need to Talk About Xenophobia Against Africans. Is there a problem with xenophobia in the black American community? Undoubtedly. Is there a problem with anti-African American sentiment in many African communities? Assuredly. And now that the divisions have been brought to light, we can begin to work on fixing them because all black lives matter, regardless of which flag flies over them. So Yitz, can you give us some background about this piece that you've written and perhaps more broadly about why this mattered to you? Well, this particular piece was, uh, I wrote this in response to what's been going on, what was going on today on Nigerian Twitter. They, uh, a one user talked about basically said that Africans were the N-word to black people. Um, another user chimed in saying that uh, you need to understand that African Americans don't give a F about Africans. And just these tweets are getting hundreds and thousands of retweets. And it's like, it made me realize that something had to be said because if this, if this is the sentiment, if this is the idea that African Americans don't like us and Nigerians and other Africans are thinking this on mass, something had to be said. And now that these types of sentiments are getting brought to light, now we can do something about it. Because uh, uh, the son of a diplomat from Gambia was killed by cops uh, not too long ago. So it's not like these people aren't. This, once someone from Africa comes to America, we're all black lives. And we're all in the same boat. So to have some division there just didn't make sense. And I just wanted to address that. I think this is a really interesting thing, this idea of, of divisions and um, sort of divisions and intersections, right? So there's a division in terms of blackness, Africanness. What does it mean to, you know, to be African-American? What does it mean to be an African in America? Um, and then also, as we've been talking about in this series, being a Jew of color and the intersecting sort of um, uh, intersecting issues that go along with that, the intersecting identities that take place. We are now, at Tribe Herald, we're going to be doing a series on blackness and, this, uh, and the complex spectrum therein because exactly like you said, someone, you know, a lot of Jews of color are Africans, are Ethiopians, are Nigerians, are Ugandans, and then... For them to come here and not feel solidarity with the black American Jewish community because of xenophobia, that just doesn't, that, you know, that can't happen. Right. Do you, so do you see it entirely as xenophobia? Do you think there's any other issues like, you know, how Israel's been involved with uh, African Jews or, or any, anything else? because they have mm -hmm. been involved with Ethiopian Jews, certain Ugandan Jews, Igbo Jews are still waiting, and so are Jews from Kenya and other places. So Israel's been selectively involved. Um, I do think a part of this is uh, trickle-down American exceptionalism. A lot of Americans, only one in five of us have passports. We exist, a lot of us exist in a biodome bubble where there's just this ignorance about the entire rest of the world. And... Breaking through that is an issue. Now, Barack attempts to social media, that makes it easier to break through that bubble. Um, but there's, you know, a part of that. And also, just the systems of white supremacy and racism have just affected us so differently. Colonialism versus chattel slavery, uh, 
path to independence versus Jim Crow. These, uh, because the struggles are so different, we're speaking English often, but speaking different languages. So we need to have that communication there too. Gotcha, gotcha. So I'm curious what you think about this. So I, someone told me they were concerned about the possibility that, you know, we have this resurgence because of Black, I suspect, I should say, because of Black Lives Matter um, and because of the um, article that was written that dismissed the number of Jews of color in America, uh, or at least assumed it was a much lower number, that now suddenly... Jews of color are, and I'm air quoting this, having their moment, right? Like now is the moment that you get to have, and then things will go back to normal, right? Do you, you're smiling when I say that. What are your thoughts around that, that comment that I heard? I, well, first of all, I, I, I would love that to be true. I would love that to be the moment for Jews of color. Unfortunately, I don't even think that that's the case. Um, that, that 6% number for black Jews anyway, and, uh, well, for Jews of, that six to nine percent number for Jews of color is haunting us. That number, that undercounting, is still something that we're fighting against, and that we're still fighting for basic visibility. So, it would be nice if this were a moment for Jews of color. Um, unfortunately, I think that things are just the normal is changing, but it's still normal. Um, that we not free to desist. Um, to get Jews of color in, uh, represented on the boards of major Jewish organizations and in synagogues, that could lead to a moment for Jews of color. Like, getting us, well, I'm just to uh, do my own one, but Tribe Herald blowing up, you know, and Jews of color being represented in media that gets the same level of audience as regular Jewish media, that could lead to a moment for Jews of color. Now we're not quite there. Now it's more like people realizing that Jews of color exist on us, and we're not just one off like Drake and Tiffany Haddish. Like, there is a community here. And now, once, now that people realize that we exist, now we can start to talk, at least start to talk about the amount of us there and um, whether or not this can lead to a moment for Jews of color. I don't think we're quite there yet. Okay, gotcha. Uh, you know, you're sort of like a godfather when it comes to online Jewish activism and, and media, as I mentioned earlier. We've known each other for quite a while. Um, what changes have you seen, right, over the past, you know, decade or so that I've seen you online doing activism for people of color, Jews of color, uh, social justice, things like that? What's the landscape like? What was it like, and what is it like now? So back in the day, I'd say around 2006, um, that was what I like to call the heyday of Jewish blogging. Um, that was when sites like Jew School, Jewlicious, Juicy, all those sites were blowing up, and uh, it's like 2004, 5, and 6, and it was just a thing to be a Jew under 40 who wanted to even be online and talking about Judaism. Uh, that would give us Jude Magazine. That would give us, um, you know, all types of outlets. And so we went from just being happy to be young and Jewish online uh, to Jews of color slowly, slowly being more and more represented. Um, when I first uh, came into Jewish media like 15 years ago, yeah, there was pretty much just me representing Jews of color. Now, you know, this thing is on BET. Um, that incre those incremental changes have been happening this whole time. Um, a big part of it, though, I think is social media. Uh, back in the day, when I first uh, came to the Jewish community and converted 20 years ago into the ultra-Orthodox world, like, you know, there was that sense of isolation there because the only people you knew were the only people you saw or the only people you had any contact with. Then would come MySpace, and that would open up that idea of a community that can exist not in the same geographical space. And now, with uh, 
Facebook and even more apps out there, more people are finding each other. So that's how, what I think has helped a lot. Uh, there's kind of that vocal, that I, I want to say, um, this kind of a, this kind of a sense of being vocal that comes just from knowing that you're not the only one. Uh, and that's what I think that we're starting to see more and more of, uh, just from people realizing, and, um, and also by people realizing that they're not the only one, there's also people realizing that that number of 60%, 9%, that that must be an undercounting because look at all these people I know, look at all these people on my Facebook, my Twitter. Um, so those incremental changes, social media, helping it along, and um, now there's been a lot more, I'd say over the past five years, organizing among Jews of color, because historically it's been Jews of color trying to be, uh, trying to get some acknowledgement from some larger predominantly white Jewish institution. Please give us a room at the JCC. Please give us a, a, a classroom in your school. And now, over the past five years, we're seeing more and more Jews of color organizing amongst themselves. For things like Jews of Color Torah Academy coming up, um, things like Drive Herald coming up. Um, and now you have people like Mordecai Ben Abram, Nisim. There's like a whole black crew in Jerusalem now. Um, you know, people who go to each other's houses, support each other's synagogues and things like that. Uh, that grassroots people helping people and linking with other people just among Jews of color is starting to happen on a way bigger scale than it did before. Gotcha, gotcha. So it seems like, you know, it's the it's the thing that has happened in a lot of communities of the internet makes it easier, cheaper, faster to put a message out there, to get together, things like that, that it's not like, you know, I need to rent a room at the JCC and I need someone to publish my article in a print newspaper that then goes out to the Jewish old folks home and, you know, all that. Gotcha, gotcha, fantastic. You can put out a targeted ad to get your message out to exactly who you want to for 20 bucks. Like, as any small fledgling organization can afford that. Whereas before, to get your message out, was, there was a huge barrier to entry. I, that's a wonderful thing for you to mention because part of PRS is our innovation program where we teach all of our rabbinical students like Amanda who's joined us this evening um, about how to build organizations and to, to hear you say you know for 20 bucks you can put something out there um, takes a little bit of the mystery out of what does community organizing look like and can I do it if maybe I'm not you know a, a programmer, a developer, a front end, back end person, you know, a marketing guru, things like that. Oh yeah, I mean, I'm I'm a developer by trade, so code is not a foreign thing to me. But I I never needed to write one line of code to get Grab Herald up to almost twenty thousand likes on Facebook. Um, build that community was literally just creating small targeted Facebook ads, creating small targeted Facebook posts on various groups, searching for various groups, and just putting it out there, raising the flag, like, hey, we're Jews of color, we exist, if you want to hear about Jews of color, come to us. And, you know, there was a, the, the audience kind of showed themselves. Uh, when it comes to building organizations, that barrier to entry just doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. Anyone with an idea can through social media, build a community in less than 30 days. How much of it is the tech, right? How much of it is being able to do targeted micro ads, things like that, versus sort of an old school, like emailing your friend uh, Yitz Jordan and saying, hey, we want to put together this class, tell me what to do. How much of it is that sort of more traditional versus versus uh, something as like a, like a Facebook ad or a Google ad? So for us, we went, that emailing your friend and telling them about your new article is a one-to-one -one level of communication, and Facebook just allows that one-to-many level of communication. Um, it's like putting up a commercial on TV. Um, so that kind of cast the net for a wide audience, um, but there's no substitute. 
for that one-on-one -on -one personal connection. You're just not going to get the same volume of, you're just not going to get the same reach by doing it one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. Um, we, that's why we kind of went heavy on social ads because we were trying to build up the audience as much as we could, as quickly as we could. Now, some in organizations that is trying to foster those real intimate personal connections might rely only on email um, and grow their audience much and grow their audience slowly, but grow their audience with deeper connections. Uh, but regardless of whether or not you use that messenger tab or you use that ad center tab on your page, using Facebook is uh, you know a great tool. Using Twitter is a great tool, whether or not you boost the post. Um, same thing with every social media. Gotcha. Uh, I love it. I love this this idea that it's it's yes and it's not either or. Oh no, it's definitely yes and. And uh, you know, there's no there's, when it comes to organization and community building, you have to reach people where they are. So you can't assume that someone is going to go to your website and read your awesome article. If they're on Facebook, you go to Facebook. If they're on LinkedIn, you go to LinkedIn. If they're checking their text messages, then go to Twilio or some other SMS provider and send a, a mass text blast. Whatever, you know, you have to meet people where they are. Because in 2020, you can't expect that somebody's going to sit down in front of a TV or a device and go and search for you. No, they're going to live their life and use the media that they want to use and use the platforms they want to use. So you just have to be there wherever they are. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I love that. Um, so you know, talking about where people sort of are, and in your case, have been. You know, you had this time in the ultra orthodox community. We've been asking questions of different Jews of color we've had in this master class who have been in multiple different types of religious communities. Talk about racism in the Jewish community. You know. I think our perception is that, you know, look, just become more liberal and then it all magically goes away. Sounds like that's not maybe the case. Well, I mean, I converted ultra-Orthodox uh, for religious reasons just because it was what made sense the most to me. Um, but I specifically chose being Hasidic kind of for that reason, like that idea of social acceptance. Um, the degree to which a Jewish person in America identifies as white is the degree to which they'll, as a white American, is the degree to which they'll identify with white American racism. So, in the Hasidic world, a lot of these people don't identify themselves as American. They uh, they live in enclaves. They aren't, they don't really out interact with the outside world. So it's more like you know you want to come here and move here and speak Yiddish and keep all these traditions. Then fine, you're welcome. Um, in the modern Orthodox world, where people are identifying more with that suburban white lifestyle, black me was perceived as a threat more often um, in like, you know, yeshivish Orthodox and modern Orthodox world. Um, I didn't really, like I said, just religious reasons didn't really uh, get into dealing with, non, with more liberal Jewish communities until like 2007. I would start performing at places like Lemur and other, you know, pluralistic uh, you know, events. And there, I find it the same thing. But, you know, to the extent that one identifies as a white American is the extent to which they can identify with white American racism. A lot of liberal Jews just simply don't identify with white American racism, period. And, you know, that's a wonderful thing. Um, I have seen race brought in when it comes to things like class. Like, um, you know, assuming that someone is poor because they're black or, uh, you know, assuming things because someone's black. And that's, all, that's just within Jews of color. Um, of course, there comes the whole assumption that somebody isn't Jewish because they're black or Latino or Asian. Um, and this person could be standing right next to them in the shul, holding a prayer book, reading in Hebrew, and it's like, oh, are you Jewish? <laughs> like, there's that racism, too. Um, but that idea of, like, 
other, I have to keep you away from me to keep myself safe, um, you know, have to do a lot of color in, uh, yeah, like I said, more assimilated circumstances. Um, and the more enclaves, the more detached from secular society areas, those types of places, sometimes I've found less racism. That's actually kind of changing recently, um, partially with Trump and uh, the politicization of everyone, um, and partially because of, also because of social media, because in the Haredi world, so many people get their news from WhatsApp. Um, so that's kind of changing recently, but historically that's how I feel. That there's less racism and the more traditional, like, old world. Gotcha. That's very interesting. Um, so thinking about um, sort of different activists that you've come into contact with, obviously Tribe Herald is one of these sources, but, um, you know, activists, blogs, social media accounts, content, what are you seeing out there beyond Tribe Herald, of course, um, that is really getting you excited, both for Jews of color and just in terms of the activism that's going on right now. What's what's really getting you excited? Oh, Kosha Soul is getting me excited, and we've been trying to get him to come to Tribe Herald. Um, and the whole, it, and it's not just the cooking team that the Jews Soul that book is awesome. The Jews Soul is recipes are fantastic, but. Uh, as, just as an activist, being out there as a, as a you know, queer Jew of color and putting his voice out there, um, being Hispanic, um, I've been watching now Jewish publications from around the U.S.-Mexico border. I just got turned on to the Arizona Jewish News, uh, profiling somebody who was a Jewish dreamer. Um, I'm really kind of noticing, I'm kind of keeping my eye on the Latino Jewish community around the border and how the immigration story is playing out with them now that the Supreme Court has said that DACA can stay, um, you know, these people aren't just going to have wonderful lives automatically, so I'm kind of seeing what's coming out of there, um, and so that's everywhere from San Diego, El Paso, Arizona, all of that. I'm um, watching on social media. I'm always watching Nyla Burton, uh, just because she's fantastic um, as an author and everything. We've been trying to get her to come to track her. Um, uh, who else? Now, and now, this is a bad thing, but uh, I have been following now, recently, I've been getting so much into anti-Semitic Twitter and following all these people. Well, not following, but just uh, I have it in my tweet deck of every time somebody mentions you. And uh, I kind of started to notice that even the anti-Semites realize how diverse the Jewish community is. And there's that, that idea of Jew equals white is getting broken even on the far right wing, which is kind of cool. Um, you know, that idea that even in the minds of the most virulent anti-Semites, they think of Jews as color too. That's very interesting. Um, you know what I was thinking about is, um, I believe some, I, I forget where in the Southwest we have the first... Um, Jewish, uh, Mexican American female, uh, uh, legislator, uh, state legislator, uh, representative Hernandez, um, who I follow on, uh, Instagram and is just delightful and is always posting amazing stuff about being Jewish, being a person of color, uh, having, you know, uh, Latinx ancestry, you know, all kinds of incredible things. And I sort of wonder, where do you think many Jews of color feel more welcome? And I know this is broad generalization, so I apologize for this, but where do you think people feel more welcome? 
in their respective uh, community of color, right? Like I am black, I am Latinx, I am, or I'm a Jew. in a community of color. Geographically, I live in a black neighborhood. Um, but as an activist and professionally, I feel more comfortable in the Jewish circles. Um, that definitely varies, though, because I've heard stories all along that spectrum from people who only feel at home in their community of color to people who only feel at home in the Jewish community. Um, yeah, that definitely varies from person to person. I'll say in uh, from person to person. I'll say that in New York, in Brooklyn, you still tend to see Jews of color in the Jewish community. More so than you see Jews of color at least visible Jews of people. Um, you know, Yamas and Sisters, things like that. Um, more so than you see them in communities of color. Uh, then again, a lot of Jews of color only show outward signs of Judaism in safe spaces where one can express that. So I don't know if I'd be seeing that necessarily in a place like Brooklyn. Very interesting. Um, sort of thinking about you have a yeshiva education. Um, do you have anything, I'm going to put you a little bit on the spot, I'm not asking you to quote text specifically or anything, but is there anything spiritually that gives you energy as an activist? Well, right recently, um, someone asked, so I got into it hard on uh, Facebook, talking about the legacy of Rabbi Abig Jamila. Now, Rabbi Abig Jamila was known for saying many racist statements while he was alive, and um, to the point that he was quoted as like an example of racism in the Jewish community. And so um, on the, well, it sounds Jewish, but okay on Facebook, um, <laughs> that, uh, that I should watch the way that I speak about Rabbi Abigail because he's a gadol, he's you know, a great rabbi. And it's like, I said, there's no such thing as a racist gadol. Because if you're racist, that disqualifies you from the title Gadol. And uh, someone says, as a response to that, where in scripture does it say, like, show me where in the Torah it says you can't be racist. And I said, like, even, all right, there's like, there's the Mishnah, the Sanhedrin, where, you know, everybody was minted from the same coin. Uh, we all come from Adam. Even without getting into that, like I said, that on, in the Gemara, in Sanhedrin, on Daf 94a, it says, uh, uh, and it's like people say, uh, until the 10th generation, I, um, until the 10th generation, uh, don't insult Arameans in the presence of an Aramean convert. Um, and at the time, I wrote that on and at, at the time that I wrote that on Facebook, and that kind of ended the conversation, I was like, yeah, I won. I got that. <laughs> um, but the more that I was thinking about that statement, you know, it's like people say, it's to the Amre Inche, like, this was a folk saying, of the, even in the times of Fazal, like, don't diss Aramean people in front of Aramean converts. So this idea of offending people, offending a convert's ethnicity has been around for quite some time, and people have been doing it for quite some time, people have been messing up like this, to the point that it became like a folk thing, like I'm telling you, this is what people say, don't say that in front of uh, Aramean converts. Um, so even in the times of Hazal, there was people, there was people who were racist against Arameans in Babylon. So. I know that I'm not going to get rid of racism in the Jewish community all at once. It's been around longer than any one person. Um, but, you know, like the mission says, where they said they are, they are. 
Uh huh. knowledge that it probably still won't have a Right. Right. And that that sort of, you know, hopeful but realistic way of viewing things is a very it's it's a very Jewish thing. I think actually, you know, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs talked about that of, you know, the Yeah, yeah. That's uh it, that's so true, I think in so many different ways. So we, as I mentioned before, we have a student with us, Amanda. Uh, Amanda, do you have any questions for Yitz that you'd like to ask? Oh, gosh. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I, I really appreciate hearing you talk about um, race and class and your experience in different, um, different Jewish spaces and how race is perceived in those spaces, like Hasidic community versus more liberal Jewish communities. Um, and, and I think you touch on something that a lot of us outside of the Hasidic community don't know or don't realize. Um, and what am I getting at? Um, so thank you for sharing that experience. Um, I, I think a question that I have for you is I am hearing a lot in our community, especially from young people of color, Jewish people of color, of creating their own institutions, their own JCCs, their own, um, you know, online publications. And, you know, as, you know, we're all in our 30s and 40s now, I, I can't consider us as the young people anymore. Like, do you think that it is a good thing, a necessary thing? It, it may be necessary that they're creating these institutions, but mm -hmm. is it a good thing? Yes, it's necessary and it's a good thing. As long as it's not a place for us and only us. Right, because okay. Because that, that kind of defeats the purpose. Then you just recreate this segregation. Um, but as long as it's a place where it's centered around Jews of color and everyone is welcome, everyone is welcome to come and eat the kosher collard greens and kosher mafongo and all of that, but it's still centered around Jews of color. Um, you know, Jews of color are kind of the only Jewish subgroup that doesn't have something like that. You know, there's a there's Bukhari and JCCs, there's yeah. the Party Community Center, there's this, there's that. Um, and and of course, so much stuff is Ashkenazi by default. So um, there's definitely a need for it, and it's awesome. Um, but like I said before, I don't think that it's ever really going to 100% erase the problem. Sure. Um, I think that it's an awesome thing. I, I want that Generation Z should be the last generation to call somebody looking Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> like that's a really big goal of mine. The Generation Alpha shouldn't even have to deal with that. Um, and I think that uh, creating more of these institutions and places where it's like, you know, of course you can get a sitter in Mandarin. Like, of course you can, like, you know, find a head covering that goes over your dress. Um, you know, real talk. <laughs> um, like places where these types of things are non-issue, uh, you know, it's going to be a great thing. Yeah, I um, you know, I was talking with a friend earlier today, and I, I also converted, and we were talking about just creating more inclusive Jewish spaces, and I was sharing my experiences as a convert that there are often times that are uncomfortable, or people just say really just horrible things, just hurtful meetings. And I said, but you know, I have the, um, the privilege to like recede into my whiteness. Like I don't automatically, people don't automatically assume necessarily that I converted because they're sitting beside me in shul. And because we were talking about racism in the Jewish community, she said, well, you know, what am I supposed to do if I see somebody that doesn't look like me in my synagogue and I was like 
hand them a door and sit beside them. Like, <laughs> what else should you do? And um, it was just an enlightening, disappointing conversation. And I hope that I gave her more to think about <laughs> and oh, yeah. gave her more to think in a productive way because it, it's, it's just, it's awful. It's awful. Treat them like you would treat any, like I tell this story <laughs> back in the day, I think it was, um, I don't remember which was it for, but the, the album, it was in Satma and Williamsburg, and the Satma Rebbe was there. So um, it must have been for some type of holiday. And um, this was my first time going to, a, I think it was, yeah, some, type, some holiday. And uh, this was my first time going to this particular Satma in Williamsburg. And I'm there, you know, totally Yiddish speaking part of Brooklyn. Everybody's considered, you know, total old world settled. And I go in there, and oh, I'm fighting to get a space in line to wash my hands, and then I'm fighting for a roll to make a mosi, and then I'm getting pushed and shoved all through the bleachers. And uh, somebody asked me, how was it afterwards? And I was like, I loved it. <laughs> I got treated like everybody else, like crap. Like, like everybody else. I got no, like, oh, do you need a place to come to Shabbos? Or, you know, no special, make, no one made me feel special in any way. And I was like, you know, that really made me feel, you know, like, it made me feel like I was at home. Type of right. Like, I, I think we have to, as, as white Jews or Ashkenazi normative Jews, like, I, there's a thin line between, like, tokenism and racism, too. Like, um, And I, I think that we have to be mindful of that, too. Like you said, don't treat somebody differently. Like, you know, shove them around like you got shoved. Um, yeah. um, but, um, but, yeah, I appreciate that that experience that you share. Yeah. I mean, I had negative experiences in the ultra-Orthodox world, too, but my most negative experiences, and I mean things like, uh, oh, being laughed out of a yeshiva once <sighs> by a who were making racist jokes, or things like not being rented an apartment and stuff like that. Very few of those things happen in the Hasidic world. Mm -hmm. Like, those things happen more in, like I said, the not an Orthodox world. Um, looking back on it, uh, I feel like I definitely made the right choice of, uh, you know, the way that I converted and all of that, but I probably wouldn't have lived in Flatbush if it was not the this area like I did. Mm. So I'm, I'm wondering, thank you, Amanda, for that question. Um, I'm wondering... The, the, we're talking a lot about race, right? Um, but we're also touching a lot on, and we touched on it earlier, class. And a really great uh, line that I heard, that I read actually, uh, was after the Tom Hanks Black Jeopardy skit on SNL. Uh, and someone, someone wrote a post, I forget what news outlet it was, that said, like, this is actually an amazing way of thinking about race and class in America, that this character that Tom Hanks is playing, who has a red hat and is clearly sort of a working working class fella, uh, sort of Southern accent, vaguely Southern accent, um, actually has a lot in common with the black community in this skit. And then it's not until the very end where suddenly there's this sort of racial tension moment. And then that's when, you know, uh, the, the episode, the uh, skit ends and it's supposed to end on this kind of low note of like, you know, Oh, we were doing so well. And then suddenly race became an issue again. And we re remembered, uh, the, the difference. And I'm wondering, you know, let's imagine a time where, uh, everyone in shul is being treated crappy as minhag hamakom, like, you know, everyone is supposed to be treated, uh, regardless of their, um, their appearance, their, their racial appearance, at least. Um, at what point then are we now actually talking about class? And do some of the experiences you had in the ultra-Orthodox community, uh, in terms of there being less racism on some level, have to do with the fact of like, well, we're all poor together. 
right, versus in more liberal, quote unquote, communities, you know, right wing, modern, orthodox, all the way to the humanistic Jews. It's, you know, then all of a sudden you get into class. And now, and I'm glad you brought this up because that I'm sure has mitigated a lot of my, a lot of my experience in, the, in, in every part, in every Jewish state, um, class, like I'm acutely aware of, you know, of being a web developer and of having a certain like level of privilege that a lot of people aren't privy to. So, uh, for me, for instance, like, um, after my conversion, the shul knew that they were having a big kiddish that was going to be financed <laughs> by me and my friends. Um, would I have gotten the same love in the shul if that weren't the case? I don't know. Um, you know, same thing in Borough in you know Borough Park, Williamsburg, Muncie. You know, I like in Muncie, I was a yeshiva bosso at a relatively you know well-to-do yeshiva. Um, would that have been the case if I was just some kid in Spring Valley who brought the bus over to there? Um, so a lot, like a lot of the issues that I'm had that I've had with race. Have only been issues with race because class didn't come in as much as it did. Yeah, it's fascinating. I was having um, a Shabbat dinner uh, uh, in, in Jerusalem, and a British Jew was sitting at the Shabbos table and uh, made a comment about, well, you know, all it, I don't even remember what the subject was, but this, but she made this comment about like, well, all Jews are wealthy. You know, and it was this unusual moment of like how how these issues of class um, come in, and we're both white Jews sitting at this table, um. right? And poor Jews in general. Well, I mean, like you said, that that stereotype that all Jews are wealthy, so non Jews aren't looking at them with any type of empathy a lot of times. And within the Jewish community, uh, in the ultra orthodox world have that idea of, you know, everybody has to give 10% to charity, but because of that, there's so, there's a lot of fraud that goes around, so actual poor people are often, like, relegated to just, like, trying to get food from organizations like Masia and from Peshabbos, um, and I don't really get the same, that don't really get that much assistance because of the people who would be giving are afraid of getting cheated out of money. Um, when it comes to poor Jews, there's not, there's, I'd say that there's more resources now for Jews of color than there are for poor Jews. Wow, that's <laughs> saying a lot. That really is yeah. saying a lot. Resources as far as, like, support and who to talk to. Like, if I were, if, if one was a homeless Jew right now, like, other than homeless services, you know, where would they go? Uh, whereas if somebody's a Jew of color and needs somebody to talk to, there's Scott Herald, there's the Color Torah Tor Academy, there's the Kola Shon, there's various organizations that could support them in that aspect. But if somebody were homeless, you know, would that be the case? We had a piece, PRS had a piece on Egypt's philanthropy where we uh, talked about uh, the issue of class and the fact that one of the things we've tried to do here at PRS by having an online format, which isn't just sort of, you know, being hip and trendy and whatever, is the fact that without a building and with minimal staff and and uh, all of that, we're able to reduce the cost of uh, a Jewish education, at least what you would compare in sort of more liberal circles, by a minimum of one tenth, um, and that's and that's the lowest of low ends of of education and um you know someone someone said to me privately well but people can get scholarships you know <laughs> as our as our student laughs you know um uh, you know and and i wonder yeah i just do you think there will be animosity in terms of sort of i'm i'm picturing this this dystopian moment for jews of color of like there's more openness in 
Jewish organizations, maybe something uh, like having Jews <clears throat> of color on boards of directors and in senior vice president positions. Um, and then in rabbinical schools, suddenly like Jews of color, Jews of color, more Jews of color, um, but then ignoring like the person who works in McDonald's, whether they're a, a Jew of color or, or uh, a white person. First of all, I, this rush to get Jews of color on uh, boards of directors and things, I really don't want it to lead to quotaism. That's yeah. my big fear. Do you think it will? That, that's my big fear. That mm -hmm. I'm hoping it doesn't. Because uh, it, it doesn't have to. And I'm hoping it doesn't. But that, I'm hoping that it doesn't get to the point that organizations are just scrambling, like, get me a Jew of color today on the phone now. I'm, I'm hoping it doesn't get to that point. Um, but this is one of the things I was going to compliment you with CRS. Like, we're not even using Zoom right now. Like, this is totally on the web. Like, even, yeah, this is totally on the web. You don't even need to sign up for anything. And you're using it with your laptop camera, and I'm using it. You can use it with a phone. You can use it with this camera, this big camera that I have connected to my laptop. Um, it's something that has absolutely no barrier to entry. Like, a, you don't even have to download anything. There's not even a question of, can my phone run? Please, please tell some of our students that who don't like this format. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, I get it. If, if you're used to Zoom, but... This is something that can run even on the, the devices that run things like Facebook Lite, your real, like your quote unquote Obama phone, your really cheap smartphones. It's even kids can access this. Wow, that's interesting. So there's no barrier to entry at all. Wow, wow! I hadn't considered that possibility. That's very, that's very insightful. Thank you for but that. Zoom only goes back so many versions. IOS or Android, and if you have your phone is too old, you can't run Zoom. Right. This is not that problem. Well, that's that's fascinating. Thank you for that's that'll be my insight for the evening. That we did something right there. That's good. I love it. Um, so, you know, just a moment here. If there's anything that you feel like we haven't talked about, anything that's been pressing in your mind, anything you want to share, um, you have the floor, please. I guess my main thing that I've been trying to get, that I've been trying to get more people involved in is Black Lives Matter. Um, the Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation, Inc., has pissed off so many Jews and has pissed off so many people with its stances on Israel, its stances on various topics, and it's like, it makes me wonder if, well, especially when it comes to Jews and Israel and things like that, it makes me wonder if Jews need our own Black Lives Matter. And uh, if that's the case, what would a Jewish Black Lives Matter look like? Mm. Just like uh, you have Jews of color starting their own things, their institutions, as opposed to larger Jewish institutions. Um, there's a question, should Jews of color start our own, own institutions with regard to larger black institutions? Because if, uh, you know, if Black Lives Matter is going to specifically exclude Israelis, for instance, then what is an Ethiopian Jew supposed to do when they live here, like so many do in D.C.? Um, it's making me wonder if there needs to be just a separate Jewish civil rights movement uh, that takes all of the... All Wow, that's that's incredible, and um, so my hope is that, that yeah, and my hope is that if there is a Jewish Black Lives uh, Matter, that uh, that uh, Tribe Herald will be uh, involved with it, uh, oh, po possibly founding it, and that I can uh, contribute in in some way. Not that my voice is necessary to it. Oh, well, uh, Yitz Jordan, thank you so much for joining us. It's been an absolute blessing having you. Thank you.